morning, everyone. Uh, well, good evening, actually, for you. Um, so this lecture today is going to go through uh, some thoughts, ideas, uh, speculations, and so on about architecture and artificial intelligence generally, and then specifically also uh, a couple of examples from work that we have been doing as a practice uh, in the last couple of years using a variety of different um, uh, neural networks. Um, so first of all, I would like to repeat that artificial intelligence uh, uh, is specifically speaking rather like an umbrella term. So it's a term underneath which we have a variety of different machine learning techniques that are specialized for specific tasks. And uh, we as architects can occasionally pick up on these techniques and shape them to become something that uh, aids us in looking for specific solutions in architectural problems or as something that can be inspiring in terms of its morphology or ideas or ideology behind it. So uh, you already know that we have been uh, running the practice span now uh, from Vienna, Shanghai and Detroit. And uh, the first project I would like to show you today is called Imaginary Maps. Uh, a post-human urban design method based on neural style transfer. So we're gonna go through a variety of different scales here, right? And the first one being the scale of the city. And uh, this is based on a paper uh, that um, Sandra Manninger, uh, Alexandra Carlson from Michigan Robotics and myself wrote for a conference called uh, Utopia versus the City, which was held at Taubman College uh, this spring. And uh, which, which um, it, uh, got a lot of attention because of its uh, unusual approach to, uh, um, to urban design. And let me start with the maximum size that we can go for, which is the moon. So we actually experimented around with uh, creating cities on the moon, so to speak. Uh, and of course, you cannot take this literal, right? This is, this is rather really like an... Uh, um, let me call it like a vision, a possibility, an idea, and also like a first attempt to understand how urbanities are um, a part of human culture. So basically uh, what we wanted to say with this paper too is that at the time we wrote the paper, which was early this year, there was already like the first um, there was already the first thinking about what to do with, uh, in terms of cities because they're, they have a specific density and thus would proliferate the current uh, uh, health crisis that we see through COVID. Uh, and there were, I think, the first papers out of people saying that cities don't have a future because people are going to, to live on the countryside in the future because it's better for social distancing. And we resisted that idea also with this project here showing that actually the city itself is such a cultural icon for humanity that needs to be preserved and, and engaged because it fosters humanity, it gives them more power. It, uh, it, there's many other uh, um, very important issues why to live in cities. And of course, city maps as such are, um, maps themselves are definitely um, a human icon. So this, what you see here is um, one of the oldest um, maps that we know of, um, which was done around uh, 1400 uh, before Christ um, in the Sumerian culture. Uh, and you have to think that from this first map we know to today, we have enormous amounts of maps, right? If you Google the term map on, uh, on the internet, you will end up with 8 billion 920 million hits, yeah, which are tagged map. Yeah. Of course, not all of them are really useful maps, right? You also end up with a lot of stuff you don't need. But the fact alone that there are so many hits shows the importance of maps in our culture. And at the same time, it shows the enormous repository of knowledge that we have uh, as a discipline in architecture, which is present through these archives and archives of thousands of plans. And if you expand those not only to city maps, but to every single plan that we have, or, or section that we've done as a discipline, then you can imagine the enormous, um, uh, you know, archive that we possess and which we can use with these new techniques that can dig through big data in a quite fast fashion. Now, how do we do that? These couples of lines of code here, 
is something you can use uh, and you don't need to write it down. This is just a representation. Uh, these lines of code are used to scrape, so-called scrape the internet for images. Yeah. Uh, what that means is that you can in include this couple of lines of codes in your Python coding when you're doing uh, a neural network and it will automatically start to search the internet for images that are tagged in a specific way. Um, this can also result in, in really funny things. Like for example, last year, we were trying to create a database uh, based on Gothic architecture. And we just put in the search term Gothic for images. Now you can imagine what you end up with when you start to search for images, you know, tag Gothic on the internet, right? So lots of, uh, lots of goth music, lots of goth clothing, lots of goth bands. So everything but really Gothic architecture, yeah? So, which means that uh, occasionally you have this, this, this search um, um, code here, but on the other hand, uh, after that, you very often have to go manually through a database and organize it so that it's useful for your purpose. In any case, you can automatize the search um, for images that you need for your databases. Now, another uh, end of this, this entire uh, research is on the one side, the scraping of imagery, the finding of, um, uh, uh, of, of uh, useful data for your, for your approach. On the other side, we have the, the term visionary architecture, uh, which, which funny enough also has uh, a close connection to uh, both machine learning as well as architecture. So on the one side, so we are working in this course specifically with techniques that were developed um, for machine vision, right? So these were developed in order to, make, to inform machines about what they're actually seeing in their environment. And those techniques turned and twisted around in a way that they start to produce imagery so we can use them as starting point for architecture design or urban design. Now, it's interesting to, to understand that uh, terms like vision, dreaming, hallucinating, and so on, they were very popular in architecture theory in the late 60s, uh, early 70s, and specific, specific in the postmodern era, where, but, but it was used in that era more as a metaphorical image, right? So people like Hans Holland, for example, who created an exhibition called Metaphor Metamorphosis, where he was talking about visionary architecture, or in the book cover that you see here, uh, called Visionary Architecture in Vienna from 1958 to 1988 by Günther, uh, Günther Feuerstein, who is a fantastic chronicler of the very uh, progressive approach to architecture in Vienna at the time. Uh, the, these terms, vision, uh, hallucination, dreaming, are also used in computer science uh, in order to describe how neural networks operate. Uh, so there is like this relationship between these terminologies used in, in computer science as well as in architecture. And uh, I asked actually our friends at Robotics why they're using these terms, which actually in architecture were more of a, let's say, esoteric nature. Uh, why are they getting used in a scientific environment? And uh, they explained to me, or more specifically, Alexa Carlson explained to us that uh, the terms uh, uh, machine vision or vision, dreaming and hallucinating um, has been used in, in computer science for a while and computer science has borrowed these terms from neuroscience. And the reason for that is that uh, aspects like, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, psychedelic dreaming or psychedelic vision or hallucination are the small aspects of our brain functions, which we think we understand fairly well. Uh, this might change again yeah, through progress in science, but for now we think that we understand what our brain is doing when we, for example, hallucinate. And that understanding can be cast into mathematical formulas. And as long as you can cast something in a mathematical formula, you can put that uh, into working within, for example, a neural network or any other sort of coding, yeah? 
this being said, the results that you see here are exactly that sort of process. It's, it's, it's a hallucination or um, a hallucination of features in different images. Right? So we, for example, created a database of Nolly maps. Uh, if you don't know a Nolly map, uh, this would be a longer conversation, but basically it's the depiction of the figure ground within an urban context. Uh, made famous by this um, uh, famous uh, this cartographer in Rome called Nolly, who created the first one, or the, the first really famous one, let me put it that way. And it it comes about once you start working with these sort of things, where you have one image in this case a crater on the moon, and you hallucinate features of a city on top of them, and you get really results out of them. It poses some specific questions. Uh, specifically, in our case, we discuss it as, as post-human sensibilities, because they're not entirely human. They're not entirely designed by me. I design the process, maybe. Uh, I, I select the imagery that is getting used, but the result is generated through an hallucinating process within the machine. So this opens up a lot of questions about you know, authorship, agency, and I discussed this already last time, um, what this could actually mean. So basically what we do here is, is, is selecting images like you see here on the left, which is an, uh, a Nolly map of uh, Barcelona in Spain. And for example, the topographic landscapes uh, on the right. And you end up with things like this. So it's, it's really uh, a provocative approach to the possibility of designing without full top-down design control by humans. Now, what are we really seeing here? What's happening in this computation? So let me quickly illustrate this with this. This is uh, some images courtesy of Alexa Carlson. So thank you very much for that. So we're looking into feature representations within images, specifically when we're working with two-dimensional uh, data, which is only based on pixels, right? And what you see here on the left side is a pixel representation of Alexa's dog. And it has some feature representations, which you see on the right. So what, what, what is this dog? It's emo emotionally manu manipulative, it's chubby and has a belly and it has floppy ears. So these are features that you can recognize, right? And that also represents a more compact representation of those features, the image. The image then gets, gets divided into its specific pixel information. So it, it, what we see here is on the one side, on the left, the, um, the representation uh, is in the form of an image. And on the right, you will see the information that the computer actually sees. He doesn't see the dog, right? He just sees information of RGB values of every specific pixel. Yeah? He doesn't understand the dog yet. He understands only the numbers that those different pixels represent. Now, how does such a network then learn what is what? And that goes through a, through a, through a convolutional um, uh, activation map. Yeah? So again, you have on the left side, the input, uh, input image, which in, which in this case is a couple of columns. Now we want to teach this neural network to understand what is a column. And it starts to understand, uh, it, it has to analyze pixel by pixel what is happening in there. Yeah, so it, it, for example, it starts to detect the edges and it starts to understand, okay, there's a specific shape going on here. And then as long as it goes through a variety of different layers, connected layers, it can start to understand, okay, that when it has an image that has specific uh, vertical lines, which have a specific end and a specific uh, top and bottom and has a specific beginning and end and so on, it starts to small, slowly understand the various, um, aspects that uh, constitute a column in an image. Yeah. So it, it has to go through a variety of different pixels. pixels. Yeah. And it starts to see things like that. So it has a variation of different things. Yes, you know, there's lines going in different directions. There's specific colors going on. And through that um, classification of this different information and through a variety of filters at the end, it's able to recognize the column. Some more examples about this. I'll, I'll just keep going with this here a little bit faster because I have a lot of content. 
um, yes, let me go jump over this. Now, um, I showed you like the largest possible example, which is uh, working on the, of the, on the urban scale. Uh, and it's surprising how interesting the results are that are created by neural networks when it is about the urban scale. Um, it seems to work really well with satellite images, for example, or with Noli maps and things like that. Now, uh, the same techniques are, of course, getting used also in, um, uh, in the arts, right? Uh, and uh, you saw before the possibility of, of these convolutions that are recognizing different edges and creating uh, a specific technique to understand what this machine is seeing. And that's getting used, of course, specifically in machine vision when it comes to cars seeing things. But you can invert that process, like really turning the information flow around. So in this case, for example, instead, instead of having a machine recognize the features of a painting and saying, yes, that's a man or that's an eye or that's a nose, you invert the flow of information and instead you try to start to generate imagery instead of um, analyzing imagery. Yeah. And that's exactly what you see here, where that understanding of what's a nose, what's an eye, what's what are lips and so on, what are edges of the painting, are started to generate this really interesting uh, weird, um, um, uh, defamiliarized, estranged imagery that on the one side, we understand we have a certain familiarity to it. So we, somebody who's inter interested in the arts, will recognize that a lot of those paintings are based on classic Renaissance imagery, classic Renaissance paintings that are fed into this convolutional neural network that uh, is starting to, instead of analyzing what is what in the image, it's starting to create the imagery at the end. And that's a really interesting process. Um, the, the first GAN, by the way, that was able to do these sort of things was um, designed by Ian Goodfellow in 2015. So this technique is rather new and that might explain why it's suddenly now exploding into the creative scene because it, it really allows for the interrogation of the entirety of the of the art history, but at the same time, it's also generating something that is different, new, um, and uh, well, new is always a, a problematic term that always needs to be explained in more depth. But for now, okay. it, it might be enough that the, uh, to say that there is novelty within this imagery, and that it has uh, a, a certain provocative quality. To it. And this provocative okay. quality, of course. Um, can be translated into an architecture design. So one of the results could be uh, uh, the, the portrait of Edmond de Bellamy by Obvious. Um, I explained this already, I think last time we had a meeting, so I'm gonna jump over this. So again, the main question for us is how architecture can be part of this conversation, right? So um, how can it be part of that conversation about uh, automation in our contemporary world, yeah? And to be critical about this, you have to consider the last decade or so of the conversation on automation and robotics in architecture, which of course is also part of automation as much as also the use of neural networks and machine learning. Yeah? And that discussion has been primarily dominated by a discussion about the capabilities of the tool to facilitate procedures or to create novel formal vocabularies. So conferences on robots and automation in architecture profoundly focus on the technological achievements and the many variations of material formations that can be accomplished using a robotic setup. From static, uh, stacking exotic figurations of bricks to fiber winding panels inspired by biological phenomena to the meticulous and precise forming of metal sheets with robots, the research essentially focused on the technological agencies within automation. And this predominantly technical conversation just rarely touched on the larger issues at hand as, as to how automation might change aspects of cultural, social, and political discourse in the architectural discipline. Now, um, I, can, I can highly recommend books like Architecture Intelligence by Molly Wright Steenson uh, that analyzes um, the, the genesis of, of this research, I would say. It actually takes four examples from the 1960s till 
the 1970s, I would say, to describe how architects became interested in computational design, artificial intelligence, all these sort of things, uh, through the examples of descri describing the methodologies of Christopher Alexander, Cedric Price, Richard Saul Burman, and Nicholas Negroponte. Um, but it also shows, of course, uh, which area has been dominating that conversation in the last decades, which is primarily white and primarily white, uh, male. So you can also be critical about that. Uh, I want to quickly repeat uh, what are the three specific aspects of uh, the design methods here, intentionality, intelligence, and adaptability. And also, again, why use an AI? Because it's better to teach machines how to learn instead of how to do things. And I explained this last time in a large, uh, in, a, in an example. And then there's generalized AI and applied AI to repeat what I mentioned already last time around. Um, one example for the generalized AI would be the use of recognizing numbers in banking systems. And we went through this example where you have to feed a system to teach it a specific number, for example. So in this case, we have thousands of images labeled five that allows a neural network through a variety of different layers to understand what a number five looks like. And then there's, of course, the problem of the post-human perception of the world, uh, which I think is highly interesting in terms of understanding that there's other ways to observe the world uh, through different lenses. And in this case, it's through the lens of a machine instead of through the lens of our biological eyes. And that different perception of the world, of course, questions very, very strongly our, our ideas about art, uh, about agency, uh, and about architecture too. Uh, what is it, for example, about how, how would you design architecture for machines instead of designing architecture for humans? In fact, that's already happening. Think, think for example, about the CERN in Switzerland where we actually created the most enormous cave, underground cave for a machine. It's not for humans. Well, let me put it this way. The, the actual architecture is not for humans. And occasionally you cannot even go down into these tunnels because they're radioactive. But the results of this giant machine are for humans because it is supposed to enhance our knowledge about the universe. So there's like this, this strange duality here between architecture that has been done for machines and at the same time, the, the, the acquired knowledge through creating this architecture for machines is in results for humans to understand the universe in a better way. Like how, 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 how did the universe start? What is it made of? And what are the forces in play? Another example, uh, wonderful example of a post-human vision of the world. Uh, this is a um, mach machine vision example uh, from a car, from an automated car. And uh, you remember maybe that I was talking about psychedelic hallucinations. This might show what this means. One major aspect is, of course, this question about AI and creativity, and that touches a lot upon architecture and artificial intelligence. Does it replace humans? Does it aid humans? Does it uh, um, expand humans? Is it like a, a mind prosthesis? Um, this is the famous uh, Bob and Ellis experiment, which was done by the Facebook Artificial Intelligence Research Unit in 2017. And it was reported as being uh, a case where AI invented a language. Um, so what happened here is that um, two AIs were discussing banking issues and uh, the programmers actually wanted to create uh, an artificial intelligence that is able to talk to humans via the phone and the human person, the human would not recognize that it's talking to an AI. And to do this, you need to train these AIs for very long periods of time. 
And to, uh, to facilitate the process, these researchers created two AIs that were supposed to talk to each other in order to enhance their, their, their ability to talk about banking issues. Now they let the experiment run overnight, they come back the next day and the AIs had invented their own language. And I remember the first time I heard this, I was completely fascinated about the possibility that you could actually train an AI to, um, or, or let me put it this way, the AIs could be creative because inventing a language is a creative process. And um, okay. so since I read for, about this for the first time and was completely flabbergasted about the possibility, um, I've started to question this process a little bit because first of all, the language is still English. It's not a completely new, different language, right? So it's really still based on English. It says, I can, I, I everything else. Balls have zero, zero to me, to me, to me. So the words are understandable. And I don't know as a human whether the content of this makes any sense, yeah? So it could be that it is just a, uh, uh, an error in the programming that created this outcome. And maybe this outcome doesn't mean anything, yeah? But that again, introduces this whole problem of us understanding artificial intelligences. Is it necessary that we understand them? Uh, do they have their own system of communication we don't know about? Probably not. I think it's very clear that we can go into the code and analyze what the code is doing. So any form of esoteric thinking that AIs are like these mysterious uh, things that can do magic things, I think we have to we have to um, reject that notion because it, that's most likely not the case. However, there's other examples of creativity in AIs. And this is a, maybe a more convincing one for me. It's the, it's the famous game between AlphaGo and Lee Sedol. Lee Sedol is a multiple uh, Go master uh, of the highest level um, who played this famous game with AlphaGo. I think they had four games or five games. I don't remember exactly how many games this tournament consisted of. But what you see here is the famous move 37. And the move 37 in this game of Go became famous because this was the move that AlphaGo, the AI made. And it positioned, and as far as I, as far as I remember, uh, it's either this stone or this, one of the two. I don't remember exactly which one of these two. Um, so the, the, he positioned that stone there. And the first comments from the commentators of the game were, oh, that must be a mistake. Uh, no one would do that. It doesn't make any sense. So this must be a mistake. And Lisa at all was really sitting there and thinking, what happened there? Why did he do that? And the commentator suddenly says, oh, that is very creative. Uh, because the, the oh, okay. AlphaGo made a move that no one would have expected from a human to do. Yeah? But it was a successful move. Because of that move, AlphaGo ultimately won the game. So uh, this was something which was interesting because it was unexpected. It was, it was eccentric. Uh, it was creative, what the AI did there. Yeah? And what I thought was really interesting was the point when the moderator said, oh, that's creative, because it didn't come out of too much thinking about it. It was almost like an honest human reaction to that move. Yeah? Uh, by the way, I would also like to mention that, there, uh, in my opinion, there is two incidents in the AlphaGo versus Lisa at all games, which are astonishing. Number one was the move 37 of AlphaGo, uh, which, which turned out to be a creative move, which won him the game. And the other move, was something that Lisa Dahl made because at, in one game, he literally crashed the AI. The AI could not cope with the move that Lisa Dahl made and absolutely went completely wrong. Yeah, started to make completely crazy moves that, that didn't do anything. So it is possible for humans literally to, to, to break an AI. Okay, let's see what we can do in architecture with all of this. Here we are again with machine vision. So machine vision is definitely something where architects can gain a lot from. Um, not only in terms of generating shapes, uh, analyzing structures or analyzing program, uh, but also, for example, in the ways how to operate a construction site. 
this is a really interesting paper from Xiao Shen Lu and Heng Li about uh, how to use machine learning uh, on the construction site. So what they're doing here is they are tracking the moves of the construction workers on the site and are analyzing their productivity within that site. Okay, there's a lot of things that are very questionable here. Yeah, uh, specifically when it comes to, to ethic things and morality. Uh, on the other hand, they might be just replacing the foreman who traditionally is in charge of uh, controlling that everything is doing their job on the construction site. But apart from controlling the construction side, I think what is more valuable here is that if you do this often enough and you can collect the information that you get out of this, which tells you exactly this person is, is pouring the concrete, this person is cutting some rebar, this person is welding the rebar. So if you, if you really have enough video footage and enough analysis like this about the movements in the construction site, you can actually design the construction process in a more effective way. So before castigating somebody who was sitting around too long, uh, you'd rather design the process in a way that if streamli it streamlines the, the, the construction site. I mean, construction sites are a messy thing. Construction sites are messy. But I think with this in, in place, you can train the workers mm -hmm. to work more efficiently, maybe even with less strain to their bodies, because of course that's also an issue. Yeah? If you treat your workers well, they will be healthy and will be able to work better and, and have a happier life. And if an analysis tool like this helps us to increase the productivity of a construction site and at the same time make the life easier for the construction workers, then I think it's a win-win. So this is something where artificial intelligence and machine learning can be extremely helpful. Now, another aspect that will come up in the upcoming years, of course, is the use of robots also on construction sites. And again, this analysis can be very helpful. If we analyze thousands of construction sites, human workers, and understand what can be optimized and how, we can actually directly input that information in, in hopefully soon to come construction robots and they will help the construction site. I am also sure that this is most likely going to be a half-half thing. So it's not going to be a completely automated construction site just full of robots, it most likely looks like it's going to be humans aided by robots. Uh, meaning that robots take over tasks which are too stressful for the human body, like carrying around bricks, um, uh, mounting heavy concrete panels, like everything where you really need to lift heavy weights, uh, robots certainly will be of enormous help or uh, taking over tasks that are too dangerous. Yeah. Uh, and just being done by humans, to be done instead by humans uh, done by robots. Uh, you see here, for example, also a little close up of one of these areas of analysis where it says like somebody's prepar preparing, somebody's yeah. fixing something here, somebody's moving something. So uh, this most likely have been labeled manually in this example. But again, if you collect enough information you can uh, certainly um, optimize that notion. And you see also here on the top, it says like productivity is 33.33%. Okay. Not entirely sure what this analysis is based on, uh, but let's take it as, at, uh, at face value for the moment and think about how this can be implemented in future construction sites. So the um, one more example where uh, we are adding to the ability to just simulate what's going on the construction side, it's the combination between artificial intelligence, machine learning and augmented reality. And I think that's a very, very powerful uh, combination. You remember before I was showing you how there was this analysis being done over the camera of workers doing specific things. 
like moving things around, pouring the concrete and so on, welding rebar. If you have the possibility to, if you want to optimize your construction site, you have to show workers what they need to do, right? Uh, in order to make it faster, more efficient, and so on and so forth. Now, what you saw here in this video, now I'm gonna play it again, is, is the training process after that, uh, as I would see. So um, you actually take the worker, you put some uh, augmented reality device on his eyes and you show him how to do the things. So you show him, look, this is the tower is going up. These are the things you need to mount on specific areas. Uh, yeah. This is how you're going to manage the construction site. So there is this, this um, interface between the analysis done uh, by using uh, a camera, for example, the process of learning through a variety of neural networks and uh, through labeled uh, information. And then at the end, optimizing the process by using augmented reality to implement that on the construction site. Let's go somewhere else, uh, just to show you the extent of how AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other techniques will influence our upcoming decade. There is many examples now already out there. This is one example from um, farming, like how farming will be influenced by this whole universe of, of computational methodologies. They include machine learning and artificial intelligence, but Actually, it's a combination of a variety of, of things. Satellite information, for example, in this case with the farmer, you can actually exactly say it's going to rain now for the next three hours. And then after that, you can plan on harvesting something or planting seeds. Yeah. So the, the whole operation of a farm becomes far more streamlined through the use of that or the use of automated machines, right? I mean, it already has started in the 20th century, the use of automated machines in farming. In this case, for example, the guy sitting here on the tractor is just controlling. He's not doing anything else. Right? He's not driving. He's not operating anything else. He's just basically the man in the loop, as this is called, yeah? Um, and for example, also here, this is a wonderful case where they are uh, immediately while they're, they're planting their seeds, um, they are connected to the, um, to the trading halls for, uh, uh, for farming goods. So they immediately know at the moment of seeding their plants, how much they're going to earn at the end of the year if everything goes to plan. Right. So this is an incredible opportunity where the cloud itself becomes part of farming and the way how information flows through this, um, this area allows for, um, for a higher yield for farmers and more profit and so on and so forth. But also I have to say that uh, it also shows the reduction of people necessary to run a farm. Uh, again, this is a, a process that started already in the 20th century. The amount of people that really have to work on a farm has become smaller and smaller decade by decade and in the uh, in the future it will be possible for example to run a farm only with a small handful of people uh, using for example artificial intelligence in this case to, um, to care for the plants and it's plant by plant this is the most incredible part about it it's not this mechanical modern idea of widespread and 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 large scale but really going into the small scale. So you have, for example, an AI that can recognize the health of each individual plant on the farm and individually getting that one specific amounts of water, specific amounts of nutrients uh, and doing this as natural as possible with the lowest possible amount of chemistry. Uh, so we're really entering a different age of farming and, 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 uh, and caring for food production here. All of these can be applied, of course, in, in a variety of different fashions in architecture. As I was saying before, I showed you a couple of practical examples. Um, uh, I think I'm going to shortcut here through the uh, different techniques that we discussed already the last time around, like um, the use of generative adversary networks um, uh, in order to generate imagery instead of analyzing imagery. Uh, uh, the use of deep dreaming, which is also a very interesting process, specifically, basically reversing the flow of generative adversarial networks, uh, where the GAN needs to make sense out of the world um, by only based on the database of imagery they have. 
aspects of style transfer. Um, oh, I want to mention something about style transfer, which I didn't say last time around, that uh, it seems that style transfer works particularly well if you use the same perspective for the different images you're using. So if you're using very different images in perspective, like is it a top view and, a pers and the perspective, or a, uh, a side view and a top view, uh, all those things don't work that well. But if you use top view and top view, or side view and side view as, as a target image and as a style image, this works better. Uh, this is exemplified with this one, for example. If you look at the perspective of the painting in the middle and the perspective of the photograph to the left, you see that there is a correlation between them. Yeah? The, the, the mountains in the image in the center and the rooftop of the image to the left, they have a similar direction. Uh, there is a tree on the on the left side of the left image. There's a tree in the painting on to the left. So all of that actually helps to create a more consistent image like the one you see here on the right. Yeah. So think about it when you're doing these processes. It's, it helps when there is correlation going on between the images. So we went through this here. Um, Going from the scale of the urban to the scale of the, of the garden, basically, like a small scale project that we did for Michigan Robotics so they can test these robots on the side. Um, so we created these boulders using uh, deep dreaming. So we are actually dreaming features of a variety of different architectural styles onto these uh, boulders or using our own imagery to dream on top. So these uh, boulders, for example, were done using some recursive algorithm uh, renderings that we did in the past. And the final result where we really went to, to, to uh, use that deep dreaming process on a very simple geometry. Uh, that's what you see here in the foreground and in the background, they're all the same geometry. They're just differently treated. Structural plans. We did the 3D style transfer. That's how we did the boulders. And I also have to say what you see in this image here is that you sometimes have to go through a, through a whole series of these processes and attempts. So don't be frustrated if the first time around when you're using these techniques, you don't get something out of there that is useful, quote unquote, but you, you might have to try it various times. Uh, there was this conversation, which is quite interesting. Um, the, the return of empirical uh, testing. Um, we, have, we have been so used to automate processes throughout the last 30 years in computational design that this attempt, this, this idea to create a series of attempts to get the result empirically moving forward was almost lost. And it's really interesting that through those processes of machine learning, this idea of empirical testing is coming back because even if you use the same images in the same process for style transfer, for example, and the same weights and everything's the same, if you repeat the process, you will get a different result. And the reason for that is one part of the code at the very beginning of the 2D to 2D style transfer technique that randomizes pixels in the image as starting point for the, for the, for the process. Uh, that means that every single time you try it, you will get something different out of it. Uh, that actually contradicts completely with uh, the famous quote by Einstein, who said, if, you, if you're trying the same thing over and over again and expecting to have a different result, uh, you might doubt your intelligence. Uh, in fact, our, this process proves that wrong. Um, anyways, this is uh, something you will have to go through. And sometimes those results, even if they're not useful per se can be highly inspiring. So I think this is one of my favorite images that came out from this whole uh, work on the robot garden that uh, it, it's it's strange, it's, it has familiarity to it. You recognize people and robots in that. Uh, it has something very powerful in it. Uh, I can't ex exactly explain what it is, but it, there's certainly at this moment of estrangement happening. Uh, and I'm certainly somebody who embraces the weird as an opportunity in architecture. Um, although, I mean, to, to an extent that it becomes something inspiring for something that can be then 
made into an operable architectural entity, right? So this is certainly used as something that has inspirational value. And finally, the result we went for is this one here. Um, and this is the current process of construction. So you can see that out of that whole process where there is defamiliarization, there is estrangement, there is some elements that, that, that have a specific language and talk in a specific way, it's possible to extract out of that uh, a possible construction um, uh, strategy. Right, and that actually then went into tactically using those to build uh, this result here. We just tested the other day the water feature, which you see in the front here, and also operates the way it should. Uh, and currently are in preparation of uh, preparing uh, the, the fabrication of the boulders. Now, imaginary plans. So again, going from the scale of the urban to the scale of the building. And I, I was really interested in, in analyzing Baroque plans and creating a database out of them that would allow us to hallucinate features within modern plans. So we created a database of several thousand Baroque plans and a database with a thing about 500 uh, modern plans. And out of these two, we created a family of, of plans that are neither nor. They're neither modern nor are they uh, Baroque. They have some uh, strange uh, qualities to them that you need to analyze. And one of these results is what you see here. Uh, this is not like a finished design. Don't, don't get me wrong. This is most definitely rather a starting point for a possible design idea. Uh, and uh, more specifically, it analyzes on the one side, uh, this emergence of fat poche spaces, which would be definitely a Baroque quality in architecture. So the massiveness of certain parts, the thickness that it has. Um, and then on the other side, the, the very modern asymmetry to it. Uh, most of the Baroque plans are symmetric. This was one of their main staples. And this, this distortion into an asymmetric plan is most certainly an inheritance uh, from the modern plans that were at play here. And out of these two, you start to analyze these this chapels and rooms and caverns and you know all of that. Um, this needs certainly more research and more, um, you need to do this process more often in order to understand, for example, how the weights within this process influence the result. This is, a, this is an extreme example of the weights. Now in, in, in the next steps, we need to fine tune these uh, weights to see if we can get uh, certain aspects under control. But for me, there's always a question of how important is it to get it under control? Like what, uh, what do I lose if I, if I put this, if I rationalize this too much? And I've seen examples of people trying to rationalize these plans and they definitely lose something in the process. They, they lose that rawness. They lose that, that really provocative uh, quality that they have. Um, so we will see where we can get with this. And then ultimately using that also in the urban scale. And I, as I said already before, it, it surprisingly operates well within uh, the scale of the city, specifically if you if you are very aware and careful about the images that you select uh, for a style transfer process. Uh, and we're continuing to work on that. Um, I would really like to apply this to a more concrete case of design. Uh, right now, it's really in the scale of of testing, probing, understanding uh, what the results are, and then it has there's a lot of necessity for an analysis here. Again, uh, this is uh, this was it for for this week. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'm curious to hear if you have any questions uh, or other concerns. Thank you very much.